Revelation chapter 9 this morning. Revelation chapter 9, this will be part 1 of when God uses evil to judge evil. When God uses evil to judge evil. Revelation chapter 9 will be considering in both parts uh, 1 through 21, but today uh, we're going to consider verses 1 through 12. So we'll read that text and pray and uh, dive in here today. Revelation chapter 9, beginning in verse number 1 and going through 12. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the eternal word of God. Uh, we are looking at amazing things in this powerful book, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, we see your power exhibited. We see uh, the fact that you restrain, that you only allow certain things. We see that you're in total control of the whole situation, of every person, thing, beast, demon, whatever it is. Total control is our great gods. We ask today that we would see your power, that we would see your glory, we would see your working uh, that's going to happen on this earth. Uh, we ask that you would just fill our hearts with praise to you for the fact that we will be raptured out of here before all of this happens. We will be with you while this is happening on earth. We ask that you would uh, uh, direct our steps now. Fill me, Holy Spirit. I ask you to do that now for this message. Uh, we want to see Jesus. We want to see your word. We want to see what you have for us today. Uh, work in our hearts. Uh, may we be open to you right now for what you have for each and every one of us today. And we ask this and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. It's amazing that in carrying out the judgment on unrepentant humanity that our sovereign God, our sovereign Savior, will actually use Satan 
and his forces, but he always remains in total control over them. It has been said the devil is still God's devil. The point is that clearly Satan is both evil and powerful, but he is still under the authority and sovereignty of our God. There is only one sovereign God, and the devil is not it. The important truth is this. Ultimately, nothing happens apart from the sovereign determination of our God. Nothing happens. God is not the author of evil, but for his good purposes, he allows evil. In Revelation chapter 9, we see our awesome God turning evil on itself. We see God using evil to judge evil. He is rightly glorified in doing this as well. Revelation 8.13 serves as a transition into chapter 9. The last verse there of chapter 8. And I beheld and heard an angel or an eagle flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. This flying angel or this flying eagle mentioned in that verse should be understood symbolically and may have a connection with the eagle-like living creature of chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Before the last three angels sound their trumpet, a threefold woe is pronounced on the earth in a loud voice. The first woe is to be identified with the fifth trumpet. The second woe is to be identified with the sixth trumpet. The third woe is to be identified with the seventh trumpet, which constitutes the final series of judgments, the seven bowls of chapter 16. The phrase, them that dwell on the earth, is used to designate those who live in rebellion and unbelief before the true and the living God. They live for the earth. When we lived in Washington, that, is, that was the thing about this, the greater Seattle area. The people lived for the fun that they were involved in. They had not one thought about bowing down to Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, I knocked on hundreds and hundreds of doors, not one convert ever. Not one person who was interested in knowing for sure that they would go to heaven when they died. It was all about the going to the mountains and skiing and going down to the sound and having a ball there on the boat or whatever their thing was. It was all they live for the earth. The things of God count for nothing to these people. What a way to live, but what a terrible way to die. Living for the earth. Chapter 9 naturally divides into three parts. Number 1, the fifth trumpet comprises verses 1 to 12, as demons are released from the bottomless pit, or we call it the abyss. Number 2, the sixth trumpet is sounded in verses 13 to 19, recording the death of one-third of humanity through demonic destruction. And third, the refusal of humanity to repent of its idolatries and immoralities is recorded in verses 20 and 21, summarizing man's response to the trumpet judgments of 8 
cha- uh, chapter 8, 7 through chapter 9, 19. In all that unfolds, the absolute sovereignty of God is on full display. Even Satan and his demons ultimately do God's bidding. They don't do what they, they do what they're allowed to do, and that is it. And man still shakes his fist in the, in the face of God and refuses to repent of all the evil in his heart and on his hands. John only uses six verses for trumpets 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now he uses 21 verses for trumpets 5 and 6. What the Bible calls the first and second woes. Point number one this morning, spiritual warfare is real and intense. Spiritual warfare is real real and intense. Chapter 9 addresses real war in real spiritual worlds that eventually invades our world spiritually and physically. The imagery we see in this chapter is terrifying. As the spiritual world invades the physical world, And demons are unleashed to bring devastation, destruction, and death. Revelation 8.13 warned us that the last three trumpets would bring three woes to the earth. That day in our text is now here. And what takes place is again hard to put into human words. Letter A, God is sovereign in what he allows. God is sovereign in what he allows. We find this in verses 1 through 5. The most important thing for us to understand is that all that takes place is under the control of our God. There's a lot of very strange and weird things that we have read In these 12 verses, he tells the angels to blow their trumpets and they do it. Uh, Chapter 9, verse 1 is where it all begins. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, the abyss. God gives Satan the key to the bottomless pit. He tells the demons what they can do and what they cannot do. He puts a limit on the torment that they can inflict. The fifth angel blew the trumpet and John saw a star that had, past tense, fallen from heaven to the earth. The word fall in verse 1 is a perfect tense participle, emphasizing an event in past time with continuing results. This star, unlike the star of chapter 8, 10, is a person. Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. The best interpretation is to see this as a reference to Satan. It is the devil himself who is in view. He had fallen already. It already happened before the blowing of the fifth trumpet. The exact time is not given. Lucifer, The star of the morning, sun of the dawn, Isaiah 14, 12. The anointed cherub, Ezekiel 28, 14, was cast out of God's presence and heaven's glory when sin was found in his heart. Now, as we move towards history's end, 
He has allowed a diabolical freedom on the earth that he was previously denied. You think he'd have done it before if he could? You bet. The key, the key and thus the authority to the shaft of the abyss, a prison house for demons and the abode of the dead is given to him by God. Immediately he opens it and smoke, dark and hot, fills the air. It blocks out, it darkens the sun. The beast, the Antichrist, also will arise from the abyss in chapter 11, verse 7. But the devil will not always have authority over it. He will be imprisoned there for a thousand years following the second coming of Jesus in chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. When the shaft to the abyss is opened, demons in the form of locusts flood the earth. Power and authority are given to them like scorpions, our text says. This reminds us of the eighth plague in Egypt in Exodus chapter 10 and the locust vision of Joel chapters 1 and 2. These are not literal locusts, however. These are demons released to torment mankind spiritually, physically, and any other way they can. Verses 4 to 6 make clear their mission. Let's look at those verses once again, 4 to 6. And it was commanded them, that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Wow, that's some pretty amazing stuff going on right there. Torment, torment, all persons, who do not bear the mark of the Lamb. That's everybody but those who turn to Christ. Believers will not be touched by these demons. They are limited in what they can do. They can torment the people, but they can't kill them. They are limited in their time to torment. They are given five months Interestingly, five months is the normal lifespan of a locust. The torment is primarily physical, stinging and striking like a scorpion. Now, they have permission to sting and torment the peoples of the earth that do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And just thinking... The way I think, maybe youth would think this too. But if I was those demons, I would sting those people constantly. I would be after them all day, all night. I would just sting them. They can't die, but we can sting them and inflict pain. It's going to be horrible. Horrible what's going to happen. We should not place limitations on exactly how they torment mankind. This is apocalyptic language. What is for sure is what they do to humanity is horrible, and they will only do what God allows them to do. Letter B, humans will suffer and even seek death, as we read in verses 5 and 6. These demonic, locust-like 
creatures torment people in a painful and severe manner, and they delight in what they are doing. That's why I said, if I was one of them, <laughs> my delight would be to sting them as much and as often as possible. They love what they're, they're going to they're gonna do all that they're allowed to do to the fullest extent. They would love to kill off the human race, but God says, nope, you may not kill them. Not, you may not do it. You can sting, but you cannot kill. Verse number six is amazing and shocking. Let's just look at that again. Verse number six. And in those days shall men seek death. How many people do you know today that are seeking to die? No, we're, we're going to hang on to this puppy as long as possible, right? In those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Wow. Wow. These evil people will seek death but will be unable to accomplish it. Go ahead, jump off the highest building you can find. You're not going to die. Kind of like the guy that my father-in-law saw jump out of a plane in Georgia, shoot and open, and he walked away. That's the way it's going to be. You can, you can jump off any building you want, and you're not going to die. It's not going to happen. Unable to accomplish their death. For thousands of years, People, for 6,000 years, people have run away from death. Only thing is, they died. Now, they want to die, and they can't. The whole thing is flipped. John MacArthur lays it out well. It is, it is not a pretty picture. So intense will be the torment inflicted on unbelievers... That in those days, the five months of verse 5, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. All hope is gone. There will be no tomorrow. The earth people have loved and worshipped will have been utterly devastated. All the things that they love about this earth are going to be destroyed. People of the earth, loving the earth, will be destroyed. The land ravaged by earthquakes, fires, and volcanoes. The sea filled with the putrefying bodies of billions of dead creatures. Much of the fresh water supply turned into bitter poison. The atmosphere polluted with gases and showers of heavenly debris. Then worst of all will come foul smoke from the pit of hell as the demons are released to spiritually and physically torment wicked people. The dream of a worldwide utopia under the leadership of Antichrist, the beast of 13.1, will have died, driven mad by the filth and vileness of the demonic infestation. People will seek relief in death, only to find that death has taken a holiday. There will be no escape from the agony inflicted by the demons. No escape from divine judgment. All attempts at suicide, whether by gunshot, poison, drowning, or leaping from buildings, will fail. Pull that trigger all day, you're not dying. <laughs> Let her see. Demons are powerful and love to harm people. Demons are powerful and love to harm people. Verses 7 through 12. This is really interesting here. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as, as it were, were crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. 
and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. These verses provide a very detailed description of these demons who have been confined, perhaps since Satan's fall. We learn, and that would make them more vicious than ever. We learn some things about these wild, violent demons from the pit. Horses prepared unto battle, it says. An army ready to fight God and his people. They are large and they are terrifying. Gold crowns indicate authority and power. Faces like men's faces speak of intelligence. Isn't man getting pretty intelligent? The, the stuff that man is inventing now by the day is incredible. Incredible. Hair, like women's hair, they are alluring and enticing. They have teeth like lion's teeth. They are fierce and they are lethal. Breastplates of iron, they are virtually invulnerable. Who can beat them? Only our God. Man is never, never, ever, ever going to beat them. Only a supernatural power can defeat them. Their wings provide intimidation as they come. Stings in their tails inflict great pain and suffering. It'll be five months of unending misery. All of this takes place under the direction of their king, the angel of the abyss. The Hebrew name is Abaddon, is an appropriate name for the king of the locust. For John's readers, the name Abaddon would conjure up images of doom and despair. Apollyon, I wrote down how to say that, I didn't say it right before, Apollyon. The Greek name is used only here as a proper name. It has the idea of one who destroys. John may have used this name as an attack on the Roman god Apollo. The persecuting emperor Domitian thought he was Apollo incarnate. So you can kind of see John kind of sticking it to him. One of the symbols of Apollo was the locust. The horror of this judgment, which God allows, is unspeakable. But the Bible says something even worse is yet to come. Verse number 12. One woe is past, and behold... There come two woes more hereafter. The first disaster that we read about has now passed. But we see two more on the way, and they are just around the corner. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing portion of Scripture that we have looked at this morning we are so thankful that we're not going to be here when all of this hits. Unbelievable. And so, Father, we thank you once again for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Most of all, for your salvation that we have in Jesus by faith in the finished work of our Savior on the cross of Calvary and the resurrection from the tomb. So, Father, today we thank you, we worship you, our great God and our Father, and we ask that you would uh, uh, use the portion of Scripture today to motivate our lives in our service for you, knowing 
what is coming for those who will reject the Lord Jesus. So, Father, make us, make us a blessing to this community and to this world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.